All right. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so, um, so as Anna said, the idea behind this talk is kind of a crazy idea when you first hear it, right? Can we use just regular old Ruby to write a brand new Harry Potter book completely automatically, right? So when you hear this idea, maybe some questions immediately spring into your mind. First of all, you might just think, why, why would we want to do that? Um, you might think, okay, what, what would that actually look like if we, if we wrote a program to write a Harry Potter book in Ruby? What would the end result be? And then the big question, and where we'll spend most of our time today, is how on earth we actually do that. Okay, so first of all, this first question, why would we want to do this? Why would we want to use Ruby to write a new Harry Potter book? Now, there's probably two different kinds of people in the audience right now. Okay, so first of all, there's people like me um, who love Harry Potter. Okay, actually, hands up if you, if you like Harry Potter. Okay, oh, I think more than, more than half of you. Okay, so for, for us, I think answering this question is really easy. Um, we can just imagine a nice, big, beautiful pile of brand new Harry Potter books. So we can just stay reading Harry Potter forever, stay in the wizarding world as long as we like. Um, and that's, that's our motivation, right? Now, hands up if you don't like Harry Potter. Who's going to admit to it? OK, a few of you. <laughs> OK, so for you guys who don't like Harry Potter, what you've got to do instead is visualize a nice big pile of money. Um, because you know, that's, of course, what you'll get if you can, if you can somehow find a way to um, please the people uh, like me who love Harry Potter and will we'll pay anything for, for more Harry Potter. Um, so here's a test, by the way. Um, if you don't know which category, if you're on the fence, you're not sure which one you are, then the test is you've got to just look at this picture and then, based on your reaction, that will, set, that will sort you into the, the right category, right? Um, so, okay, so anyway, that's, that's the why of why we might want to do this. But on a, on a more serious note, there are some other reasons, right? One is that this is going to introduce us to some concepts around natural language processing, right? Using um, machines to work with language, which is a really, really big developing field. Um, and I think it's also going to show a lot of the power of Ruby. Um, when we see the finished version of this program, it's really simple Ruby code. We can actually do some pretty crazy stuff. OK, so what does this actually look like? So I'm basically going to show you the end of the talk. I'm going to show you the final story that we're going to generate as we build up this Ruby program. OK, so, so here's the spoiler to the end of the, the talk. This is what we're going to end up with. OK, so I'm going to read this aloud. Neville, Seamus, and Dean were muttering but did not speak when Harry had told Fudge mere weeks ago that Malfoy was crying, actually crying tears, streaming down the sides of their heads. They revealed a spell to make your bludger, said Harry, anger rising once more. OK, so it's not, um, it's not perfect by any means, but it kind of has um, the feel of a Harry Potter you know, story. Um, it more or less makes sense. It's more or less um, sensible English. And Hopefully, when you see how little code it takes to actually generate a little story like this, um, you know, it, it, it's pretty impressive what we can do with just a little bit of work. OK, so now the big question is, how do we do this? How do we use Ruby to generate Harry Potter stories or any other kind of language? And this isn't immediately obvious how we should do this, right? I mean, if we just take one sentence from that story, how do I write a Ruby program to write a sentence, to create a new sentence like this? You know, where, do I, where do I start? Um, it's a bit intimidating, potentially. So the first key idea that sounds really obvious, but is, is really, really important, is that when we're telling this story, we just focus on one word at a time. And this is the case for any time we're generating language. We usually want to just focus on one word at a time. And the second key idea that's going to help us is that um, we all have a great source of inspiration um, in our pockets or in our bags right now, um, and those are our phones, our smartphones, because our phones are actually capable of doing a lot of this already. So what do I mean by this? Well, um, probably a lot of you know and are familiar with um, autocomplete, right? So usually we use autocomplete 
um, you know, this, this middle bar here to just speed up our typing. So as we're typing something, uh, we, we use it to, um, to uh, type faster. But there are some interesting things about autocomplete. So one is that we can actually use it to generate language. So I don't know if you, you guys have ever tried this, but what I'm doing in this video here is I'm just pressing the middle button of my phone and not doing anything else. And what's kind of interesting is it starts to generate a sentence right without me really doing anything. Um, now, the other interesting thing about this is if, uh, if you tried this on your phones, well, I mean, first of all, I guess all of your phones, uh, it will be different because you know, your phones will be in Ukrainian, well, probably most of you. But even you know, between you, if everyone tries this, you'll end up with a different result because your phones learn your style of speaking. Yeah. So your phone's actually learning as you type, and it's tailoring these suggestions based on the way that you speak every day. So how does my phone know this? How does my phone kind of predict the way that I talk and imitate the way that I talk? Well, somewhere in the phone's memory, it's keeping track of the words that I use and what words I use after those words. So somewhere in my phone, they know that after the word birthday, for example, Maybe I've used the word um, party 30 times. I've spoken about birthday party 30 times. I've spoken about birthday cake a little less, maybe 20 times. And like that, it knows what words I'm likely to use after birthday, um, and then it can rank these suggestions based off of that memory. Now, what's really interesting now is we can do that for any kind of language. So I can take the Harry Potter books, and I can take any word in the Harry Potter books, like the word golden, and I can look at what are all the words that appear after golden in the Harry Potter books. So, for example, with this word golden, um, the number one word that follows golden in the Harry Potter books is egg. So golden egg, that phrase, appears 13 times. Golden snitch, um, which is like a, a Quidditch ball, for, for those of you who don't know, um, appears 11 times. So, Taking the same idea on you know, this imaginary Harry Potter phone, if we type the word golden, our suggestions would be egg and snitch, and then after that is plates and so on. So a couple of uh, uh, bits of terminology that I'll keep using. This first word that kind of uh, gives us our suggestions, so golden in this case, we'll call this the head word. And the words that are potential uh, suggestions, we'll call those continuations. OK, so basically, this is the big idea. And we can use this big idea to start generating stories. And we need to do it in two steps. So first, we need to get our program to learn how um, J.K. Rowling, in this case, learn how she uses language. And then, once we've learned her style, we can generate more language in that same style. So basically, all we need to do is we need to do that that I just showed for the word golden. We need to do that for every word in the Harry Potter series. So as I said, we know that after the word golden, the word egg appears 13 times, um, and snitch appears the most, next most often. But we do that then for every other word in the series, so gold, golden, goldfish, golf, and so on. Um, all in all, there's 22,000 different words, unique words that are used in the Harry Potter books. Now. Um, uh, now, just looking at this slide, you know, thinking about how we translate this into Ruby, you know, looking at this, um, hopefully you can kind of already see how we might store this in a Ruby program. So this is going to live really nicely as a hash, yeah? a Ruby hash that looks like this. So for every individual word, like golden, we have a another hash inside here. And for each, uh, each entry in that inner hash is going to be you know, all of the potential continuations and how often they appear. And that's going to be our memory, if you like. That's what we're going to learn in our Ruby program. OK, so how do we actually write a program that generates a memory like this? Well, um, the first thing that we're going to need is data. right? So we just need the Harry Potter books in some kind of text format. Um, there are various places you can get this. If you guys want to try this uh, yourselves, then um, you can go. I've put links to where you can download these, these text files if you want to experiment afterwards. So we're going to start off by, by loading in the text file. And we just want to do a bit of data cleaning to start off with. 
So um, what we do, first of all, is something called tokenization. And uh, basically here, we just want to do things like get rid of punctuation. We want to get rid of you know, capitalization. We don't care about uppercase, lowercase. Um, we want to just simplify everything down. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, and then we also want to convert everything into symbols, because that's going to be a lot more memory efficient. So once I've done my tokenization, then the actual procedure for building up this memory is really simple. It's literally like a few lines of Ruby code. So let's break down what's going on here. And by the way, um, I'll put a link at the end with all of the code if you want to look at it. So, so don't worry too much about remembering this or writing this down or anything. So what we're going to do, um, so there's a, a few things I want to highlight. So what we're doing is we're using this each cons method, which is a really nice method built into Ruby. And that's going to take each consecutive pair of words in our text. So in this case, we'd start off with the consecutive pair, the and cat, right? Um, and then what we're going to do is we start off with our stats that we're collecting here as an empty hash. And then we're going to add a new entry um, for this combination of head word. So our first word, the, and our second word, cat. And then we're just going to increment the count, increment the number of times we've seen that pair of words. So we've seen the word cat follow the word the one time. OK, that's going to be the first iteration of the loop. And then the next iteration, our pair becomes cat and sat. And we're going to increment that count once. And that's, that's all there is to this program. We can let this run, and then eventually we'll end up with something like this. So we're just keeping track of every head word and how many times the continuations appear. Yeah. And that's literally all there is to the learning phase. So we can just we can run this on the whole Harry Potter um, uh, text file, and we're done. Okay, we've learned we've learned the style of the Harry Potter books. Okay, so how do we use this to generate um, a new Harry Potter story? So there are a few different approaches, a few different algorithms we can use. So I'm going to start off with the most simple, um, and this is called the greedy algorithm. Okay. So the reason that we call it the greedy algorithm is um, the greedy algorithm always kind of uh, doesn't have any self-control or willpower. It always just goes for the sort of the easiest, um, juiciest thing. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take our example from earlier, right, where we said, OK, the word golden is followed most often by the word egg in the Harry Potter books. So what the greedy algorithm does is it would always choose the word egg after the word golden. Yeah. So it's just always going to pick the most likely continuation. So how would this look in Ruby code? Well, again, it's really, really easy. So remember, we've collected our, our stats, um, which, remember, is our nested hash, where we've got our head words, our continuations, and the counts. And what we're going to do is we're just going to pick the continuation that has the highest count. So we're saying continuations. Uh, max by count. Yeah, we're just going to look at what has the highest count, and that's going to be the word that we're going to choose um, as the next word in our story. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to keep running this. We're going to keep choosing a next word in our story, and like that, we can build out um, a whole new story. Now, there is one tricky thing here. If we're using the previous word to predict the next word in our story, we have to do something different for our first word in our story. Yeah? So if our previous word is golden, we know that we'll pick egg as the next word in our story. And then after egg, we'll pick whatever the most frequent word is after egg. Um, for our first word, we can just pick any word, any word that appears in Harry Potter, so any of those 20,000 words. Okay. So, this is, so there's quite a lot of different pieces that I've talked through. But if we put this all together, we can now generate our first story. So to recap, we're going to start by picking a random word. Then we'll generate, say, a 50-word story. And we'll do that by always picking the most likely word, the most likely next word, based on those stats that I collected at the beginning. Okay? And then at the end, we're just going to join that together into a story. Okay? So I hope that makes sense. Um, so what does this look like when we try this? Okay, does this work, our greedy algorithm? Okay, so I ran this, um, and this was the first story that came out. Okay. Oh no, said Harry. A few seconds later, they were all the door and the door and the door and the door and the door. Okay, so this, 
this doesn't seem great. Um, remember, the first word in my story is chosen randomly. So maybe I just got unlucky and picked a bad word to start my story. So let me try it again. This is the second time I ran it. Surreptitiously, several of the door and 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 the door. OK, so the good news is that we definitely know what our new Harry Potter book is going to be called. Um, the bad news is that, well, the bad news is pretty much everything else, right? Um, this, uh, yeah, this isn't a great story. So, so what on earth is happening here? Why, why is this? gone so wrong? Well, basically what's happening is we're getting stuck in a loop. So after every word with the greedy algorithm, we always pick the most likely next word. So for example, after the word several, the m next most likely word is the word of. The m next most likely word after of is the. And the next most likely word after the is door. And after door, the next most likely word is and. But you can probably guess what's going to happen, or what's coming. The next most likely word after and is the. Yeah. So we just get stuck in a loop, um, always picking the next most likely word, but we, you know, we're going to keep generating and the door forever. And this always happens. Um, interestingly, the, the best word I can pick is the word conference, um, you know, just, just by coincidence. And that gives me a 20-word story before I get stuck in a loop. But it always happens. So basically, the greedy algorithm doesn't work. Okay, we can't use the greedy algorithm. So what else can we try? Well, another approach is to just be completely random. Okay, and this is what we call the uniform random algorithm. So how does this one work? Well, basically, it's very very simple. When we have our our head word and our potential continuations. We're just going to pick any continuation randomly. Yeah? So we're just going like, to pick anyone, like, pick, pick them out of a hat. Um, uh, so in this case, if I had three possible continuations, I'd pick one of the three. Each one would have a one-third probability of being chosen. Uh, in reality, I'm usually going to have many more potential continuations. So after the word golden, there are actually 117 different words that could come after golden. I'm just going to pick one of those 117. Again, this is super simple in Ruby code. So I can just use the sample method here, and that's just going to pick one of my continuations with equal probability. OK, so how does what do I get if I generate a story um, with uh, the uniform random algorithm. So this is what I got the first time I ran it. Debris from boys or accompany him bodily from Ron, yelled the waters. Harry laughing together, soon father, would then bleated the smelly cloud. Um, OK, so, um, so it's, it's definitely better than, than our first try. Well, maybe not definitely better, arguably better. Um, but it's still pretty, pretty far from sounding like a Harry Potter story. So what's gone wrong this time? Well, basically the problem is that the uniform random algorithm isn't doing a very good job of imitating the style we're trying to emulate. So um, for example, if we take the word house, um, so if we think about the words that could follow the word house in the Harry Potter stories, um, the word elf follows the word house um, in the Harry Potter stories, 102 times. So a house elf is like Dobby, for, for, for those of you who don't know. A house elf is obviously a very common thing in the Harry Potter universe. The word prices, so like house prices, uh, uh, occurs once in the Harry Potter books. But the problem with the uniform random algorithm is we're equally likely to talk about uh, house prices as we are to talk about house elves. So that's not really doing a very good job of imitating the style of Harry Potter, right? What we really want to do is we want to maintain some of that randomness, but we want to do it in a smarter way. So if we go back to the house elf example, the word house appears 700 times, and uh, the word elf follows the word house about 100 times. Okay? And, but as I said, it, the word prices follows the word house only once. So intuitively, it seems like elf should be about 100 times more likely to occur after house uh, than prices. Yeah. So what we really want to do is rather than picking completely at random, we want to 
weight the words that we choose based on how frequently they occur. Yeah? So think of it like a raffle. Yeah? So it's a raffle where the word prices gets one entry into the raffle, but the word elf would get 100 entries into the raffle. So we're basically going to change the probabilities so that they match how frequently those words appear. Um, now, this is a little bit more complicated um, in Ruby. Not, not that much more complicated. I, I won't spend as much time on this, but basically, going back to that idea of the raffle, basically here, using this multiplication method, um, we're basically kind of doing that, what I spoke about. We're, we're kind of giving each word a number of entries into a raffle based on how frequently each word appears, and then we're using sample at the end to draw randomly from that raffle. There are other ways and libraries and things you can use to do this kind of weighted random selection, um, but this is one approach that works quite well. And this gives us our, sort of, uh, our most convincing story so far. Springing forward as though they had a bite of the hippogriff, he staggered blindly, retorting Harry some pumpkin tart. So it's still, it's starting to get there, starting to get closer to a real sort of Harry Potter story. Okay, so there's, there's one last big idea that is going to make our story even better. And to explain this, let's go back to our autocomplete example. Now, one thing, again, if you open up your phone and you try this, if you type, in this case, I've just typed the word and on its own in my phone, uh, and I get these quite generic suggestions, you, if, I'm. But if I type in a phrase like fish and, um, I get much more relevant suggestions, right? Now, what this tells us is our phones aren't just looking at the previous word that we typed. They're looking further back into the history. And this is exactly what we want to do if we want better stories. Rather than looking at the previous word, we look at the previous two words, three words, or whatever. Now, how does this affect our code or affect our memory? Well, it's basically going to be exactly the same thing, but rather than having single words as our heads, we're now going to have, uh, and this, by the way, we call this a bigram model when we're only dealing with pairs of words. We can make what's called a trigram model where we're going to deal with three words. So we're going to consider every two-word phrase in the Harry Potter books and what are all of the words that could be the next word in our story. Okay. So everything else pretty much stays the same. We are going to end up with a lot more, um, a lot more uh, entries in our, in our memory here. So remember, we had 20,000 unique words that appeared in the Harry Potter books, but we'll have about 300,000 uh, unique two-word phrases that appear in the Harry Potter books. So we're going to need more processing time and more memory, but you know, it's still very, very fast on a modern computer. Now, the good news is, and, and again, this is where I feel like Ruby's kind of power and elegance really comes out. Um, we need to change almost none of our code. So I don't know if you guys, I'm sure a lot of you will have used the splat operator. So the splat operator basically means that we can now say um, our head, rather than being a single element, can be a variable number of elements. So this is basically going to be an array. And then we can basically say, that this each cons, rather than being two, we can change that to a three or a four, or however, um, you know, whatever number that we want, and everything else is going to work exactly the same. So I, I think that's pretty cool. So yeah, and, and then as you can see, what this is going to generate is exactly the same kind of thing, but now our keys are little arrays rather than single, single symbols. OK. so. Um, I won't read all of these aloud, but basically the idea is that as we increase the number of words that we're processing, that we're storing in our memory, we get um, better and better stories. So if we get, use the trigram model, we'll get a, a more convincing story. Uh, and this is the one that I showed at the beginning. This is a, a foregram model. And we can keep increasing this you know, using five words, six words, seven words, and you know, generally the quality of our stories are going to keep improving. Um, so I, I just want to uh, pause at this point to uh, to kind of show off the final program. So this is a perfectly valid program to generate a brand new Harry Potter story. Um, and of course, there's like a lot more things that we can can do uh, to improve this further. 
But we basically solved our problem in, what, like 10, 12 lines of Ruby code. And none of the lines are that complicated or, or that crazy. And this, uh, oh yeah, so tw 20 lines of code in all, I think. And this got me thinking, and this is just a, something I want to close on, that um, you know, some people kind of, uh, when I gave this talk previously, said, well, you know, is this talk still relevant to me if I you know, don't care about Harry Potter or I never want to use Ruby to write a Harry Potter story? But I think this also says some interesting things about just hard problems, right? How, as developers, we tackle hard problems. Because when I first thought about this idea of writing a Harry Potter story with Ruby, it seemed like it would be really hard, but turned out to be actually quite easy. Um, and whether you're a sort of a new programmer or whether you're a very experienced programmer, I think it's worth thinking about like hard problems and how we tackle them. Um, you know, if you're a you know, if you're a, a new programmer, because the first time you come across a hard problem, you know, it's really easy to panic and think, oh my God, how am I ever going to do this? Um, if you're an experienced programmer, you might be more able to tackle hard problems, but maybe it's difficult to explain your process and how you go about addressing difficult problems. So for me, doing this talk, I thought there were three kind of interesting things about tackling hard problems that came out of it. So one is understanding how to break down a hard problem is really, really important. Uh, then looking at failures and really understanding them is incredibly helpful. And often finding a good metaphor for a problem really helps. So on this first one, um, how you break down a hard problem. So there's this proverb of how do you eat an elephant? Um, you do it one bite at a time, right? And Whenever you're tackling a hard problem, it's really useful to try and find out very quickly what is the equivalent of a, a single byte. Now, now, sometimes this is going to be very obvious. So for example, if we're writing a chess program, a chess AI, well, then um, one byte in this universe is going to be a single move. We're usually going to want to uh, think about you know, making the next move for our chess program. But sometimes it's, it's more difficult to think about what's a single byte, right? How do we break down a big problem into smaller problems? So for example, what if we're working for Google and we're working on the Google Maps routing algorithm yeah, to, get from, to get from London to Hogwarts, for example? So one way to think about this is really a routing algorithm is just a series of turns, right? That, those are your decision points. Um, if you can pick the right series of turns, you, you know, you've succeeded, and often we can just consider one turn at a time. Or it might be something much more complicated, right? Like, let's say, uh, you know, as we saw in the first talk, face detection you know, or facial recognition. That seems like a very, very hard problem on the face of it. How do we break that down? And in a lot of approaches, in this case, it's really about um, identifying these facial landmarks, right? So suddenly, this big problem um, that seems really difficult is really about, well, you can start thinking, oh, how do I get this dot in the right place? And then, how do I get the next dot in the right place? And you can break it down more easily. So if you're coming to a new hard problem domain, find an expert, if you can, and ask them, well, what are the sub-problems here? How do I break this problem down? OK, so the second thing that I would really encourage is paying attention to your failures. Again, as developers, you know, we're, we're told to read our error messages and, and, and so on. I think that's really important. But more generally, whenever you try an approach and it doesn't work, really try and think about why that was. So you know, we had our example from earlier, right, of our failed first attempt. And it would have been very easy to just throw that code away and give up and say, no, this doesn't work. But actually, by really thinking hard about, well, why didn't this work, mapping out its execution, we were able to sort of find new ideas for making an improved second algorithm. Um, so yeah, always ask yourself, why didn't this work when you come to a dead end? And that will often give inspiration for a solution. And then the third point is, I think it's often really useful to find a good metaphor for your problem. So you know, often when we're just staring at code and thinking about things abstractly, it's hard to find a solution. I found it much more easy to think about this problem once I started thinking about autocomplete and thinking about my phone and start playing around with it physically and understanding how it works. Um, and a good metaphor, you know, not everything is a good metaphor, right? A good metaphor is something where you're going to keep the essential elements of the problem. 
Um, and ideally, it's something where you can play around with the metaphor and actually learn something about the original problem. So here's an example of this that I really love. Some of you might know this already. So imagine that you're building a timetabling system for Hogwarts. So your challenge is to um, schedule classes, so no uh, two classes that someone is taking are scheduled at the same time. Yeah. So I'm going to show um, a bad timetabling. So in this case, um, uh, classes in the same color are scheduled at the same time. And I've made a mistake here because I've scheduled ancient runes and arithmancy at the same time. They're both in pink, uh, but Hermione's taking both of them. So this is an incorrect timetabling. Okay. Now, timetabling programs are quite difficult to write, um, but they're especially difficult if you're just staring at things like this and trying to think about it in, in this way. You know, how do you begin to solve this problem? I don't think it's obvious at all right? if you haven't done it. But what's really interesting is we can find a nice metaphor for this problem. Okay? And it's basically a game. So the game is we start off with dots representing the different, um, the different classes. And if uh, two students, or sorry, if a student is taking two different classes, then we just connect them with a line. So for example, Hermione is taking ancient runes and arithmancy. We saw that earlier. So ancient runes and arithmancy are connected with a line. Yeah. Um, and then and, and these basically represent potential timetable clashes. And then the game is just you've got to color the dots so that no uh, dots of the same color are connected by a line. Okay? And this is called the graph coloring problem. Some of you probably know it. But what's nice is that the, these two problems are a metaphor for each other. They're analogous. Uh, so if you can solve the graph coloring problem, you can solve the timetabling problem. But what's, what's nice about this as a metaphor is that you can actually do it on pen and paper, right? You can start playing around with it, you can start finding strategies, and then you can start porting those back into your timetabling program. So you'll often find examples of this. There's a nice metaphor for your problem that you can play around with, understand the problem better, and then come back with, with new solutions. So always ask, what's a good metaphor for this problem? OK, so that's my recap on, um, on hard problems and some of the things that came out of this talk for me. Um, and yeah, I've put a bunch of uh, the slides are online. Um, the code for all of this is online. Links to where you can, can download the Harry Potter uh, books in text format are there um, if you want to try this yourself. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening. More and the door and the door <laughs> and the door. We have time for a couple of questions. Guys, girls, raise your hands, say your name, and then ask the question. Why are you taking photos right now? <laughs> You'll have the slides on the YouTube, of course. Yeah. The Ruby community is pretty big on TDD, right? Yeah. So have you thought about how you would test the quality of the results? Mm, yeah, so it's a really good, uh, really good question. So um, yeah, I mean, so on the, first of all, there's, there's a, uh, one thing I want to pick up on on TDD. One thing I didn't really get to show uh, in this talk um, is that is using tests when you're developing something like this. Um, and it's actually really, really nice. I think this is a, a really good reason to do these kind of things like uh, NLP type applications in Ruby because testing is really, really helpful. Um, you know, when we were building up that whole like stats hash or something like that, it's really nice to be able to, you know, do this, work this out on pen and paper and then write tests. Um, and, you know, especially when you're doing more complicated algorithms, testing really, really helps a lot. Um, the one thing that is difficult is, uh, is yeah, testing the quality at the end. Um, usually when you're testing this kind of thing in, um, in real life, you use something like something called mean sentiment score, MSS, um, which is basically asking people, um, how good do you think this is? Um, uh, so, yeah, it's still basically in, in the industry when people are testing this, they just, they just ask people, how good do you think this is? Um, so I don't know if we'll have any automated way of testing this anytime soon, um, but certainly a lot of the other parts you can, you can write automated tests for, and that helps a lot. 
Okay, one more question over here. Uh, thank you, uh, very interesting. And what is with M&M's George Bush story? Oh, right, okay, so, well, uh, <laughs> so, so I think Anna asked me to send an interesting fact about myself, and I said that I once ate uh, some of George W. Bush's uh, M&M's, uh, like chocolate M&M's, which sounds like a very exciting story behind it, um, but it's not actually that, well, it's, it's not that interesting. Um, basically, I had a friend who worked for the US Air Force, and on Air Force One, um, they make special pres presidential M&M's, which are only uh, red, white, and blue M&M's, uh, and uh, my friend stole me a packet of those, uh, and they were very nice, so uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. I have the last question. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, You got up really early today, like five o'clock, mm -hmm. took a flight from London to Lviv, and how are you now? Yeah. <laughs> you, what is the first impression? For, first time in Ukraine, first time here on Tivarak? Yeah, yeah. My, how do you no, like it? My, my impression's very, very good. Everyone's been very friendly so far, and uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah as, as you said, it's my first time here, so if anyone's got any recommendations or suggestions of anything that I've got to do while I'm tomorrow here. Tomorrow you're also here. Because uh, yeah, tomorrow I'm also, also so. here. So come tell me afterwards. Uh, yeah, anything I should try. I'm open, open and ready. So yeah. Thank you so much. We <laughs> have a special gift for you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you.